chapter. So the very first section we're going to look at is section 2.3 and this is going to be the carbon compounds. Alrighty, so looking at this first slide, you're going to notice that we're going to be looking at the chemistry of carbon. Now when you talk about the chemistry of carbon, you talk about something called organic chemistry. All right. Now as the name implies organic, it's something natural. Now what's special about carbon? Well carbon atoms have four valence electrons and this allows them to form strong covalent bonds with many other elements. Now for some of us, if you haven't had a lot of chemistry, you may not know exactly what a valence electron is. Well a valence electron is basically the electron that is going to be found outside of the nucleus of the carbon atom and this is going to be the electron that's going to be available for bonding. Now what's special about carbon is that it can actually bond with up to four different things at one time. Now an easy way to sort of represent this is to look down here at this diagram. If you look at hydrogen right here, you're going to notice that hydrogen only has one valence electron in its outer shell. And because it only has one valence electron, it can only form one bond with another atom. Oxygen has two, if you notice. We have one here that's available for bonding, one here that's available for bonding. So it actually can form two bonds with um, two other atoms. Nitrogen is a little bit better. It can form three. We got one there, one there, and one there. Uh, but again, carbon is just kind of like the maniac of bonding. We have one there. We have one there, we have one there, and of course we have one there as well. So we can form bonds with, um, could form bonds with hydrogen, like you see here. Um, could be oxygen, could be phosphorus, could be sulfur, could be nitrogen. But again, it could form bonds with lots and lots of other atoms that are found on the periodic table. Now again, carbon is pretty significant because in addition to being able to bond with up to four other atoms, it can also arrange itself in lots of different ways. Um, if you notice, it can form single bonds, it can form double bonds, and it can form triple bonds. And down here, you can sort of see how this arrangement might occur. Um, we have methane, which is basically just four um, single bonds around that carbon atom. Here we have acetylene, which is going to form actually a triple bond right there. You can see butadiene, which is going to form a double bond, I think, right through there and there. Then we have benzene, which actually has a mixture of single bonds and double bonds. Then, of course, we have isooctane, which has lots and lots of single bonds. And, of course, if you notice, they can form chains, they can form rings. So carbon is pretty versatile when it comes down to bonding, which makes it a pretty significant type of atom. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. So the types of molecules we're going to be looking at in this section are going to be called macromolecules. Now, just as the name implies, macro basically means big. All right. So many of the organic compounds in living cells are macromolecules or giant, sometimes is what we'll use, um, molecules made from thousands or even hundreds of thousands of smaller molecules. Now what they do is they go through a process called polymerization. So looking off to the right hand side, this is an example of polymerization. So this is what you have. You have basically these smaller units which are called monomers and that would be represented by these purple, these green, these blue, and these orange units. These are put together to form what we call a polymer. So polymerization is taking all of these smaller units, hooking them together to form this long chain. Well, this long chain basically becomes our macromolecule. All right, so that's how macromolecules are formed. Again, lots of smaller units, and those units can be lots of different things uh, connected together to form the polymer. All right, so the first macromolecule that we're going to look at is going to be carbs. Now, there's going to be four different types of macromolecules. We're going to have carbs, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. And we're going to look at each one of those in detail. But again, the first one we're going to look at is going to be carbohydrates. Um, carbohydrates are made of carbon, <clears throat> hydrogen, and oxygen atoms, but they're put together in a certain ratio, a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. Now, if you look on the right-hand side, this is an example of a carbohydrate. It's an example of a simple sugar. And you can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbons, like you see over here. You can look at the oxygens the same way. 
we have one, two, three, four, five, six oxygens. Then of course if we counted the carbons there would be 12 carbons there as well. So that's how carbohydrates are put together if it's a simple carbohydrate. Now living things use carbohydrates as their main source of energy. The breakdown of sugar such as glucose supplies immediate energy for all cell activities. So whatever the cell needs to do to keep you alive that's what it's going to use for its energy. Now plants, some animals, and other organisms also use carbohydrates for structural purposes and that's what's represented over here on the right hand side. Um, this is a form of starch and starch is what we call a complex carbohydrate because what you have is you have a lot of these smaller units of glucose possibly hooked together to form a long chain and that's going to be able to create these structural units that you see right here. <clears throat> So when we're talking about carbohydrates, we talk about different types of carbohydrates. And there's actually two categories. We have simple sugars and we have what we call the complex carbs or the complex sugars. So single sugar molecules are known as monosaccharides. All right. Now if you look at the word mono here, mono means one. So we have one unit uh, could be one unit of glucose, could be one unit of, well, it could be galactose, could be fructose, just depends on the type of sugar that you're looking at. But it's considered a monosaccharide if it's not in the form of a chain, it's just a single unit. Now, we do have things called disaccharides, and a disaccharide would be something like sucrose and table sugar, the sugar that you would enjoy in your cereal, um, maybe you would use in, in cooking. Uh, this is a disaccharide. Now, this is actually a combination of glucose and of fructose. All right? So we have two units that are connected together right here by a bond and those two units, again two, di means two, um, is going to create that sucrose. And there's other types of um, disaccharides out there as well. But again, mono means one, di means two. So these are what we call the simple sugars. Now when we talk about the complex carbohydrates, that's a little bit different. Um, you can also identify these as what we call polysaccharides. Now saccharide means sugar. All right? So poly means many. All right? So we basically have many of these monosaccharides, these smaller single units of sugar connected together to form a long chain and that's going to give us our polysaccharide or our complex carbohydrates. For animals, we have glycogen, and glycogen is a polysaccharide, and it stores excess sugar in animals and is broken down when your blood glucose starts to run low. So it's basically a storing energy for us, and so when we don't have those immediate um, simple carbs to, to pull from for energy, it's going to start pulling from that glycogen. It's going to basically take the energy from that molecule and, and we're going to use that for whatever we need to use it for. So the glycogen stored in your muscles supplies the energy for muscle contraction. So that's one example of how glycogen would be used. I mean, if you're exercising a lot, um, you're going to start to pull from the reserves of glycogen. Now, if you're a plant, you're going to be talking about starch. All right. So plants are going to store their excess um, sugar in the form of starch. And so again, it's still a reserve of energy for those plants. Um, another type of polysaccharide that plants would use would be something called cellulose. And so if you look over here on the right hand side, you're going to notice we have a picture uh, of a very tall plant. In order for that plant to remain rigid, um, the cellulose molecules have to come together in a certain way to form a structure, to form a lattice, to keep it upright. And so cellulose is going to form um, structure for the plant. All right, so that's going to finish us up for this screencast. This is going to be the first of two screencasts for section 2.3. If there was an assignment that was connected to the screencast, please make sure that you get this completed before you come to class.